So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Adams. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions here at the Hamels College of Arts and Sciences. Um, so thank you for coming for uh, this is part of our virtual lecture series we run each fall. Um, we bring in faculty and, and uh, current graduate students and alumni uh, to speak on various topics. Uh, but I would like to introduce today's pre presenter, Dr. Molly Scanlon. Uh, Dr. Scanlon is Associate Professor uh, in NSU's Department of Communication, Media and the Arts. Here at NSU, she has taught undergraduate and graduate courses in everything from advanced college writing, editing, layout, and design, special topics in writing, research methods, uh, and more. Uh, some of Dr. Scanlon's academic research interests include uh, visual rhetoric, rhetoric uh, of identity, and mindfulness. Uh, for her doctoral dissertation, she studied um, teams of, of comics, writers, and artists, uh, and their collaborative uh, multimodal uh, composing processes. Uh, Dr. Scanlon has written and co-authored numerous articles and presentations, including Stories of, of Becoming, uh, which was co-authored with two other faculty uh, from NSU um, and will be released uh, before the end of the year. So congratulations to you, Dr. Scanlon. Uh, tonight's lecture will be a large part an informational webinar on the therapeutics benefits of writing. Uh, in addition, Dr. Scanlon and, uh, and I will both be available to answer any questions about any of our graduate programs uh, offered, especially within the Department of Communication, Media, and Arts, including our Masters of Arts in Composition, Rhetoric, and Digital Media. Uh, so please feel free to ask any questions throughout the presentation. Um, there is a chat box uh, and also a Q&A section that's there. We can also open it up uh, for questions as well. Um, uh, over uh, Zoom, so you can actually talk there as well. But now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Scanlon. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I appreciate it. Um, oh, can you uh, enable screen sharing, please? Yes. All right. You should be able to do it now. Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so um, one of my latest adventures is um, the intersection of two fields. So I have been uh, teaching writing and studying writing since, gosh, 2005. Um, and a couple of years ago, I started to redirect my interests to um, therapy, marriage and family therapy. And I started to notice some very cool intersections between the two. Um, and I've wanted to do um, some preliminary research on the therapeutic benefits of writing for some time. So this talk was a really great opportunity to just start exploring this topic. Um, so that being said, this is a really cursory introduction. Um, I don't have a ton of research compiled on it yet. Um, so this is just kind of an introduction and um, an exploration, an initial exploration, if you will. So I hope you enjoy it. And it will include writing because that's what we do. So uh, let's start there. Um, the therapeutic benefits of writing that I'll be talking about today is cognitive benefits, which is primarily um, the processes in the brain and how the brain communicates with the rest of the body. Also some emotional benefits as well as physiological benefits. So that is also how the body responds. Um, and we're gonna talk specifically about how the body responds to stressors and how writing is a method of reducing stress and preventing burnout. So given the nature of our lives lately, my hope is that you will both learn something tonight and also uh, receive some of these benefits <laughs> by engaging in the writing activities that I have embedded throughout the presentation. So let's write. So I've given us about three minutes just to jot down some ideas. What brings you here this evening? Um, what intrigues you about writing? What would you like to learn this evening? And then I want you to write down three things that you need to do. So think about your to-do list, anything that's uh, kind of bubbling up in your mind as you're trying to focus <laughs> and be present and just write them down and then put them off to the side. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to share this writing and I'm not going to collect this writing. This is simply to introduce you to the process of writing for uh, different purposes.
and just about 30 seconds left. And not to worry if you haven't addressed all of the points. But if you'd like to get to them, you could shift your attention now and just jot down a couple of ideas for yourself. Okay, so let's get to talking about some of these benefits. I decided to start with thinking about the cognitive benefits of writing because one of the earliest scholars in our field of um, writing and communication is a woman by the name of Janet Emig. And she was one of the first people who proposed that writing um, could be more than a container for expression or more than just a finished product in itself. She started to explore some of these ideas about what happens when we write or while we are writing. Um, and one of the things she did is she compared reading and writing to listening and speaking, right? And she determined that reading and listening are really kind of receptive activity activities, right? We're taking information in and talking or speaking and writing are productive activities. Additionally, writing is also a technology, right? So um, if you think about historically the earliest civilizations, um, writing is something that emerged say, I don't know, 10,000 years into human existence, whereas uh, speaking and listening were integral, right? In fact, some of the things that separated us from other mammals and other primates specifically were our linguistic abilities. So thinking about writing as a technology, um, in that case, you think about um, that's something that's kind of formally taught, right? It's something that maybe doesn't necessarily come innately to us. We have to learn how to use it and we have to learn how to use it in certain contexts, right? So um, also writing is a uniquely personal process and that is something that's come to inform how we teach writing. So thinking about how writing happens has been equally important to us in writing studies. And one of the coolest things about Janet Emig's research is that she declared that writing is a uniquely powerful multi-representational mode. And what she meant by that is that when you are writing, you are engaging the hands. So it's an inactive doing activity, right? It's iconic, which means that the eye is recognizing the symbols of, as letters and making meaning with them. And it's also representational or symbolic. So taking um, an idea in the brain that maybe is a little bit abstract and trying to concretize it, put it into something that is concrete, such as words, right? So this hand-eye-brain um, cooperation, multi-representational modes of learning um, makes writing a really unique um, practice in terms of cognitive benefits. And this leads to... Um, greater focus, attention, uh, cognitive functioning in general, and also memory. So if you think about sometimes maybe writing things down, not just because of fear to forget them, but also in the fact that if you write something down, you may be more likely to remember it. So thinking about the cognitive benefits, I would like to challenge you first to type on your computer what was your understanding of what I just shared about the cognitive benefits of writing? I'll give you about a minute and a half for that.
And now I'd like to challenge you to experience that writing process a little bit differently. So now I'd like you to move from typing your response to grabbing a pen and paper and handwriting your response. Still the same question. What was your understanding of what I just shared about the cognitive benefits of writing? All right. Okay, so go ahead and set that writing aside. And now we're going to talk about the emotional benefits of writing. So I have a great quote here from Bezel van der Kolk, and he says, if you have been hurt, you need to acknowledge and name what happened to you. Now, this is an author of a really um, popular book um, in psychology, in the fields of counseling and therapy, and it's called The Body Keeps the Score, um, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. And there's a specific section in the book where he talks about the benefits of uh, writing and trying to language um, things that have happened to us, um, hurtful things, traumatic things. We won't quite go that deep or personal this evening, but just to give you an example of some things that um, the field of marriage and family therapy has done, there's actually an entire model of therapy called narrative therapy. And the idea is that we each have stories, um, multiple stories that we tell about ourselves and um, I use selves intentionally because we all have different um, identities, so to speak, that we share, emphasize, highlight in different situations, depending on where we are, right? Um, and that very much feels like the process of writing. When I'm writing an email to my students, I have my professor hat on, right? Um, when I'm writing a text to my mom, I'm thinking about my role as a daughter, right? Or as a sister or a member of the family in some capacity. So the narrative therapy model uses writing for a lot of different reasons because they're, they're understanding that we all have these stories we tell about ourselves. One of those ways is to externalize. So this is taking a problem that we believe to be inside of ourselves, right? Something um, maybe such as mental illness, like depression or anxiety, and actually taking and perceiving that problem as being outside of ourselves, that it is something that we are interacting with. It is not something, it is not a part of who we are. So externalizing, as you can imagine, can be a really powerful process in the therapeutic um, process because you are asking people to de-identify with something um, that for whatever reason is causing conflict or causing problems in their life. Another way that this model uses writing is to literally re-present, so to re-experience, re-come into the present of an experience or remember. So to bring yourself back to a situation and remember, literally reimagine the people um, present in that moment. So the different members 
um, in the room that day or in the space that day. Um, and they use it for a couple different examples, but just for the purposes of our um, talk tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to um, practice either externalizing or representing or remembering. And all of these are towards the goal of developing alternative stories. So if, for example, I worked with a client once, a young boy, and he had this idea of himself as um, the troublemaker in the family. And when he understood himself as the troublemaker in the family, um, he saw himself as um, a bad kid, right? So that choices that he made weren't just bad choices. They weren't just what he did. They became who he was. Um, he didn't think that he could ask for things because he didn't think he was deserving of them because he was a bad kid, right? So we used writing, I used writing with this client to reimagine what else could he be other than the troublemaker, other than the bad kid. And he started to slowly de-identify with this idea that he was a bad kid and start to identify with himself as sort of a cool kid, right? So what makes him fun to be around or charismatic? So you'll have the opportunity to do that too. The important, um, one of the important benefits of writing is also languaging our emotions. So I've shared here, um, this is called a wheel of feelings or a wheel of emotions. And, um, one thing that's kind of interesting about our culture in Western culture is that we're not all that articulate about how we're feeling and uh, emotions and traumas are already difficult to language. So the more that we can do in terms of articulating how we're feeling and what our experiences are, um, the more we can get closer to those memories and those traumas, right? And kind of start to unearth them and remember how they made us feel. So. Just to give you an example um, of some feelings and just take a moment to read some of them. Just uh, the inner circle is kind of broad categories. And as you go out to each ring of the circle, they get more and more specific um, in terms of emotions. So just taking a moment to look that over, see if there's any you identify with right now or identify with in general. And if you'd like to take a screenshot or take a picture with your camera, I'm gonna to go to the writing prompt next. But if you wanna have this available to you, I highly recommend it, keeping it up. <laughs> All right, so for our next writing activity, exploring some of the emotional benefits of writing. You have a couple of options here. So I'd like you to just choose one just for time purposes. You could externalize a problem that you're having or conflict that you're having and write it a letter. So, you know, dear stress, why do you make my life so hard, <laughs> right? Why do you fog up my brain? Um, why do you make me feel like I can't handle the things that I've, you know, committed to or that I want to do in my life, right? Or you can remember and represent a story. So this would be an opportunity to retell a story from your past with a new perspective. So you can reimagine, reinterpret the events, the people that were there, your place in the story, right? And remember, the goal here is to kind of entertain or develop an alternative identity for yourself. Change the ending, right? Have yourself say that witty thing that you wanted to say to that person at that time. So choose one, either externalizing or remembering and representing. And I've got three minutes on the clock and just take your time enjoying the process and the experience.
All right. So go ahead and finish up whatever thought you had writing you were writing down at the moment. And if you were really into what you were doing, jot down a couple of notes if you would like to return to it after the webinar. After all, these are your writings to keep and to benefit from. All right. So we talked about Janet Emig's um, claim that writing is inactive because it involves the fingers, the hand, right? Um, but there's actually several, there are many physiological benefits of writing because if we look at writing as a uh, creative expression or positive social interaction, if you are writing to someone um, or as an expression of your emotion, right? Crying, laughter, frustration, um, then these are ways to what Emily and Amelia Nagoski in their book, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle, so they call ways to complete the stress cycle. So I'm gonna have to go into like a little bit of physiology and anatomy of the body, um, but I promise it's gonna pay off. And actually the benefits are, are beyond writing as well. So hopefully these are some really cool takeaways. So the human nervous system has an on switch and an off switch. It is called the autonomic nervous system. And what autonomic means basically is that it operates independently of any kind of conscious thought, right? So any intentional thought. This is just how our body responds to stress. It's not necessarily something that we have any control over, right? Especially in post-traumatic situations. That's why it's called post-traumatic stress because it is an involuntary stress response. So the sympathetic nervous system is what we all know of as fight, flight, or freeze. So if you imagine yourself um, having a project that is due or um, a talk or a presentation, anything that kind of creates some anxiety or makes you feel stress, um, you can start to think about how your body responds in that situation, right? And then, we also have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the off switch to that. It go ahead, it tells the body, okay, we are safe again. You can go ahead and continue digesting food. Um, you can rest. It's safe to you know, close your eyes, for example, that kind of thing. So the stress response manifests in multiple ways. So it's cognitive in that the mind begins to race, right? It's um, scanning the environment that you're in, looking for threats, looking for perceived threats. Um, it's also emotional. A lot of times we feel fear or anxiety um, or even more intense emotions when that, that body, that stress response is triggered and also physiological. So think about, um, the situation I just described, you have something, um, you know, coming up on your to-do list and maybe it is, it's just the thought of it uh, kind of triggers this response in your body. Um, somebody who would be very nervous in a public speaking situation, right? This talk might uh, incite that phys physiological response, right? So you think about the heart begins to race. Um, the pupils dilate because they want to narrow the focus and try to figure out what the perceived threats are. And of course, the stress response was like super helpful when human beings were just trying to survive, right? And not be mauled by a bear. Um, but at this point in our evolution, these stressors or these perceived threats um, trigger the stress response in us. Um, on a daily basis, if not multiple times a day. And there is a difference between the stressor and the stress, right? So the problem is after that talk, after that report is done, after that really stressful meeting with your team or whatever, you may feel some feelings of relief, but maybe that heightened arousal in the body, that physiological response, is still present to some extent. We still need to do something. The stressor is long gone, but the stress remains in the body. 
So the Nagoski sisters describe it like this. There is a stressor in our life. Traffic, a project at work, a test, public speaking. Then the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. Fight, flight, freeze. This is a way to protect ourselves to survive. That's the reaction, the stress response. Then we have the absence of the stressor. We get out of the car. We finish the report. The meeting is over. The talk has ended. And the parasympathetic nervous system says, ah, okay, the stressor is gone. So we are safe. So you can go ahead and not be stressed anymore. But just because the stressor is absent does not mean that the stress is absent. It actually remains in our physiological response. And the problem is, as we have these stress responses throughout the day, this leads to what we consider burnout. So when we have stressors and we don't complete the stress cycle, and then another one kind of piles on top of it, there's an impairment of working memory, of decision-making, problem-solving, everyday cognitive functioning. Um, and if you think about when a time in your life, maybe when you were really stressed and overwhelmed with things that were going on in your life, you may have experienced some of these, right? Um, oh, I forgot to do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know. You decide for me, right? Um, problem solving. Every small problem feels like a very large problem to overcome. And even everyday cognitive functioning, maybe your shirt was on inside out, right? <laughs> so simple operations like that. When our body is filled with the stress response, it can be very difficult for the brain to work in its normal, usual ways. So I'm just gonna stick to the next slide. How do we complete the stress cycle? So the Nagoski sisters did extensive research to find out how do we get the stress out of the body? Now, the number one thing that they determined was physical activity, getting out, going for a walk, moving, exercising, okay? The number two was deep breathing. Now, I think this relates to writing because when you actually sit, focus, and single task in the act of writing, your breathing becomes regulated and calm. The more direct influences on writing are positive social interaction. So in that activity that we just did, for example, of representing or remembering, if you are remembering an example of an interaction with somebody, you may be able to put yourself back in that space, that place, and replay that social interaction in a way that is positive for you. And that's one of the ways that it is used in therapy. A big old cry. So this is a big one, right? It's very physiological, right? It literally requires a physical response from the body. And sometimes in writing, one of the earliest um, researchers on the benefits, like psychological benefits of writing was a man by the name of Pennybacher. And he did experiments with his students and he had one group write about their everyday life, something like that. And then the other group they had write about something very, um, hurtful or traumatic that had happened to them. And the students in the act of putting into words something that maybe they'd never shared with another human being before, crying was a result, right? Becoming tearful in the act of putting that, that experience or those emotions into words. Also laughter, right? So any emotion that we are writing about or, um, that really we're reading about as well, right? The brain responds through something we call mirror neurons. I'm not gonna get geeky into that right now, but laughter is contagious and really crying and laughter have a very positive um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It's like, we can move very easily from one to the other. Um, that's why people try to tell jokes at funerals, right? Or they tell stories about someone's life and they'll get very um, sentimental and personal. And then they will also remember um, a really funny experience with the person, right? And we can easily move from that laughter to tearful. And lastly, um, I think probably perhaps the most obvious one is creative expression. So just writing for the act of 
um, creating, telling a story, writing poetry. I mean, I think this is what most people think of when they think of writing is kind of writing for expressive purposes. Um, so that, that was number seven. That was another way to finish the stress cycle. So as you can imagine, by engaging in these positive social interaction, crying, laughter, creative expression, you are finishing the stress cycle, which tells your body to stay in that parasympathetic nervous system state to regulate the heartbeat, regulate the breath, slow down the processes of the body and bring yourself back into a calm, stress-free state. And, oh, great question, Jerry. Um, so Jerry said, how many students have you worked with? We could benefit from implementing this at our high school in New York. Um, I would love to talk to you about mindfulness and writing activities in high school. That's something that um, we implemented in Broward County Public Schools um, shortly after um, students started attending school virtually. So I did quite a few workshops for them. Um, so yeah, remind me at the end of the talk and I'd love to share more about that. I think it's a very cool, um, time that we're in that people are starting to embrace some of these practices for our students. Yeah. Um, and I just I added this story because I or this slide because I thought this was a very cool image of the different parts of the brain that are activated when we are telling a story. Um, and I loved it because it uses literally the example of listening to a topic on a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> versus telling a story, right? So um, it's talking about activating the language centers in the brain, which Janet Emig talked about the uh, cognitive benefits of writing, um, but also activating um, motor cortex. So that's what I was talking about with the mirror neurons. Um, it's interesting, the motor cortex in your brain will light up when you are watching um, a movie about dancing, for example. So for all my dance movie fans out there, if you are intrigued on this, Google mirror neurons and motor cortex, and you will find out that your brain receives some of the same benefits of watching other people <laughs> move their bodies as when you move your body and exercise, which is not a replacement for exercise. As we can see, physical activity is the number one <laughs> way to complete the stress cycle. Um, but it is very interesting after we watch something like that, um, our brain actually can have some of the same like physiological benefits um, and also just emotions, right? When we uh, listen to other people's stories, when we watch very emotional or dramatic movies, um, experiencing the story as the person who is telling it or as the person who it's being told about, right? Can incite crying, can incite laughter, can uh, put us in the place of a positive social interaction. So any storytelling that also ignites some of these things. Um, when we are the writer and we are kind of going and producing this writing, all of those benefits are woven in, which is just, sorry, I get kind of geeky, but it's just so fascinating to me. The brain is incredible. So let's give you an opportunity to complete the stress cycle, right? So take a moment. Um, if you want, you can recall those three to-do list items that I had you jot down at the beginning of the presentation. Maybe one of those is what's stressing you out right now. And I ask you to think about when did the stressor occur in case it's something from the past, right? Or when will that stressor occur in case it's something that is, uh, again, on your to-do list or in the future. And thinking about what I just shared about the stress cycle and those seven ways, like what can you do to complete the stress cycle once the stressor is gone? And how might writing be a part of that for you? I know that's a lot of questions. So just kind of whichever one resonates with you, feel free to hop to. And I will set the timer for three minutes.
All right. I gave you a little bit more time there because I have a feeling people might be really getting into the rhythm of writing at this point. So that's kind of the conclusion of the formal part, but I love the Q&A that's come up so far. So I really encourage more question asking. Um, Matt, is it possible to just allow people to unmute themselves and ask questions? Yeah, absolutely. Let me just uh, go into the Q&A and I can actually go to each shank. Um, just give me one second, I'm gonna go. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing at this point. Um, if a question pertains to something on the PowerPoint, I can always pull it up again for clarity. No problem. Allow to talk. So Kay, would you like to ask a question? I'm not sure if you had on there. I was able to open it up. And Judith, let me also give you an opportunity. So I allow both of them, I believe, can talk. Wonderful. Molly, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Kate. All right. Hi, Molly. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. I've really enjoyed listening to you. And in fact, I've read some of the resources that you've suggested. Um, I see that you responded to uh, my question, um, but it cut off part of your response. So I was just wondering if you could help me um, to answer that in regards to resources for specifically elementary age students. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for those of you watching the recording, Kate's question was about um, wanting to provide students an opportunity to write in this way to kind of process emotions or talk about stressors, but that writing um, may writing itself may be the stressor, right? That's part of what, what is preventing them from being able to express themselves. So in that situation, I really encourage external processing through um, just speaking aloud, right? Or also, um, using multiple modes is helpful. Drawing pictures, like images are something that I really think that we, um, we start to, I don't know, kind of infantilize. And it's kind of unfortunate. I learned that in doing my research with comics writers. The image is powerful, right? I mean, think about a picture's worth a thousand words. Think about movies and films. Think about the last time you watched, you know, one of those things where somebody put music behind a picture slideshow of you and your friends. Like it can be so powerful. Um, so I would encourage any kind of expression um, that can help them externalize. Um, obviously, the field of therapy and counseling uh, is pretty much entirely based on this idea that speaking aloud and languaging what's going on uh, internally with us is very powerful for healing. So, um, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I would encourage any kind of mode that they feel comfortable with. Um, and one thing that we do in the practicum that I'm working with right now is we meet one-on-one -on -one with students, but we give them something to do with their hands. So a fidget toy or uh, coloring, for example. So we kind of satisfy that physical need uh, to move um, and kind of activate that part of the brain, while, which gives their emotions a chance to come up a little bit. So I hope that's helpful, Kate, and I'd love to share more, you know, if, if you would like more. <laughs> Absolutely. I would love to connect with you. And as you were thinking, you were saying about the um, importance of having something in their hands while processing, I discovered that typically it's my students who are expressing their emotions in a more physical manner, um, yeah. really struggle with the writing component. So I'd like to be more proactive versus reactive in our disciplinary procedures and figure out how we can incorporate that before um, you know, a big explosion or before we need to begin processing that they can develop some tools. So thank awesome. you. I'd love to connect. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Cool. Thanks. Molly, I had a question. Yes. Uh, yes. First of all, I always enjoy your presentations. You are so knowledgeable, and insightful and beautiful. Um, my question was, when, um, when I was using reflective writing with some of my students, mm -hmm. uh, I would find myself very uh, self-assured in um, facilitating the exercise and giving them writing prompts and, and the mm -hmm. whole thing. However, when certain issues arose in the writing, 
I found myself in that oops moment, like, oh, how do I address this now? So there's a, I mean, you are a, a trained therapist. So for you, it's not an issue, but for most people who are not, yeah, there's a, there's a debriefing part that's always kind of, uh, I don't know, tricky. I don't know if that makes sense. Always. Absolutely. And you can imagine as a writing teacher, I mean, uh, for example, I went to Virginia Tech for my dissertation, uh, Cho, who was the um, assailant in the massacre of Virginia Tech, wrote mm-hmm. letters in his English composition class mm-hmm. that ended up sending up red flags. And, you know, so often when we are teachers in the classroom, we end up getting these interactions with students that, um, you know, if we're taught to be able to recognize the red flags, it can be really helpful. So the first thing I would say is like, don't put pressure on yourself to be you know, a therapist in that situation. Like, yes, I'm studying therapy, but like, it's still not appropriate for me to work with students and therapize them in the classroom setting, right? That really should be left to somebody um, in the, in the proper setting, just for ethical purposes. No, no, of course. But I feel like we stir something up. We encourage them to write about it and they are kind of uh, moved uh, by it in, in a positive or negative way. And it's a, it, I'm, I'm always feeling that there's a, that I wish for some guidance on how to debrief that. Like, what do I do with that? I mean, instinctively, I kind of like know what to do, but I wish for more guidance kind of. Yeah. So I, um, I think that's a good question. Um, I think what you're looking for is kind of like a closure activity. Basically, yeah. you've opened yeah. a can and it's kind of like, how do we close it before we <laughs> the classroom kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, some of this comes in preparing. So for example, having them do a reflective writing activity with plenty of time so that you Mm. can do that, right? Sometimes. Um, Also, you can put parameters around reflective activities. So, you know, for example, I talked about the emotional benefits of writing about trauma, but I'm like, we're not going to talk about that tonight. I just want you to think about an everyday stressor that you're dealing with right now. Mm. So, you know what I mean? You could tell them like, this is the intention of what we're doing and make it really clear. Mm. Um, I think, and this is great for the first year seminar course that we teach, but like also just at the end of every writing activity or emotional discussion, reminding them of the resources that are available to them. So we do have the, the counseling service at NSU. Um, yeah, makes sense. Maybe not at every school, but most public school systems have family therapists or yeah. family counselors, mental health counselors, right, that are on staff. Um, and just, you know, make it normal. Like the more we talk about it, the more we normalize and destigmatize things like um, talk therapy, right? Like, hey, if something came up in your writing today, like, don't forget you have this resource available to you. You could, um, you know, dive even deeper and, and, and learn even more about yourself in a setting like that. Um, so, you know, so rather than feel like we have to contain it, just remind them where the setting is that they can explore it more, like Makes the more sense. appropriate setting. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're an amazing teacher. Thank you. You're this amazing person. I, uh, there. I'm so glad you joined tonight too. But Dr. Scanlon, you know, one, the one thing I, you just hit it on the head, I, I think, and I, I don't mean to jump in in here, but reminding of the resources. I feel like we never, you know, I, I never, we never do that. And even when I talk with students here at the graduate level, you know, reminding them of the resources, especially at the end of the conversation, because usually you're remembering yeah. the end of the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a great point. Yeah, yeah, I was you. very grateful a few times to have those resources because I found myself in that. I opened this kind of worms and oops, where smartly help, you know, so. Oh, yeah, but I think, I think, but that can happen in any situation, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and and the truth is, you know, mindfulness, this kind of writing or expression, emotional processing, like, I think the more small opportunities we provide um, ourselves, our students, our coworkers, you know, to do things like this in the appropriate context, like the less likely we are headed for a burnout or an explosion or, you know, so it's also about becoming habitual or practicing it that way. Um, So in those contexts that we have control over that, it's really cool if we take that opportunity. So creating space for reflective writing in your classroom is an incredible first, like incredible Mm -hmm. place to you know start yeah yeah well i really enjoyed this thank you everyone thank you 
Thank you, Dr. Scanlon. I appreciate the audience attending. And I know we've had some some Zoom issues here uh, um, on here, but we are recording. So um, if you don't mind, Dr. Scanlon will uh, share uh, your contact information with the Zoom recording to the, the registered attendees that uh, here as well. And hopefully, um, you know, people get to enjoy it as much as we did already. So. Awesome. No, I really, I enjoyed the opportunity. Like I said, this is an intersection I've been wanting to do for a while. So it was a really cool excuse to, to kind of nerd out for a moment and see where these two areas connect. <laughs> and also don't forget when you get this new PhD, which will be your second, you need a third one. <laughs> don't waste any time. All right, but I'm going to go to the beach like at least a day between the two. Like <laughs> yeah. I'll come with you. It's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Have a great night. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for everything, Matt. Appreciate it. Bye, Matt. Bye.